Thank you for having me. My name is Joe Harden, and I teach at a small uh, a small college. It's here in LA, LA County, so not too far from here. Um, it's an undergraduate institution, um, and we're small, but fortunately, I get to work with really, really phenomenal undergraduates, um, including Sarah Colando, who really did the lion's share of this work. Um, and this is also collaborative work with my um, biology colleague, uh, Thanai Schultz at Harvey Mudd College. All right, so um, I'm guessing that many of you in this room are familiar with some kind of high throughput sequencing data. In fact, you know, you may use it in your, in your regular day-to-day -day work, um, but there's lots of different kinds of high throughput sequencing. Um, so I really like this image that's due to Reuter et al. On the, um, on the x-axis is uh, the year of the publication that sort of started that particular technology, and on the y-axis is the number of um, citations that that particular uh, paper has, has received, log, log base 10 um, citations. And the upper um, blue circle, that's RNA-seq. All right, so that's the paper that kind of formalized what RNA-seq is, and, um, and certainly that's the most common sort of high throughput sequencing technology that's used um, kind of right now. Um, I'm going to talk about ChIP-seq, which is the, um, the sort of the, the green one on the, to, the, to the below left of the big RNA-seq. Um, so let's see if I can, there's ChIP-seq right there and there's RNA-seq right there. Um, and, and high throughput sequencing generates a particular type of data structure. And collectively, as this image points out, we have um, figured out all sorts of creative ways to use high throughput sequencing to measure different biological aspects um, uh, the, of interest. And the class of sequencing um, you know, faces a common set of data analysis challenges, but each of these methods has kind of its own particulars and, um, and unique challenges. So, um, so this work that I'm talking about today builds on prior work that, in fact, I've presented here at CGSI, um, where we were talking about normalization and how to get those apples-to-apples -apples comparisons using RNA-seq. Um, and today I'm going to talk about ChIP-seq data. So what is ChIP-seq data? Um, so uh, ChIP-seq data, the, the key is that um, we can figure out where particular proteins are binding to the genome. Okay, so uh, what do we do? We chemically cross-link a protein to the DNA. Uh, then we break the DNA into small pieces. We add antibodies, and those antibodies hopefully bind to the protein of interest and nowhere else. Um, we capture the antibody, and the antibody brings along the protein. The protein brings along the DNA, um, and we reverse cross-link, which removes all of the protein and the antibodies, and we have little strands of DNA that, that have been affiliated, bound with that particular protein of interest. Um, so we're really going to be interested in understanding the, the, how much DNA and, and what pieces of DNA um, were, were sort of found by this process. So key to, to what I'm going to be talking about today is going to be these little, these little pieces of DNA down here. Okay, so, so we take those pieces of DNA and we, um, we align them to our genome. So there's, um, there's this overarching question in many ChIP-seq experiments where, um, where the question is, how is protein binding different across d experimental conditions? Um, and we can dig down into that how, and we can ask questions like, where does the protein bind? And that's peak calling. So that's finding where on the genome um, is, the, is the protein binding, and how is that different across experimental conditions? But a second question we might be interested in is how much protein is bound. So not just where is it binding, but to what degree um, is it binding. And we call that differential binding, and that's really the focus of today. So uh, peak calling is, is super, super important, but we're going to assume that we've done that, and maybe we're going to assume that we've done that well, and then we're going to follow up with this, with this second question of differential binding. So what is differential binding? <laughs> 
We say that a region is differentially bound across two experimental conditions, A and B, um, if there is a difference in the amount of protein bound to the DNA per cell on average produced under the different conditions. And I say that per cell on average bit just to kind of remind us that we're not doing anything single cell, <laughs> um, right? So, so we're doing this um, you know, in, in larger amounts, so no single cell stuff. So right, the same, same image here, um, but now we've got this idea of experimental condition A and experimental condition B, and we're really, again, interested in the amount of DNA that we're recovering um, at this bottom level here. You know, how is this amount of, of DNA for condition A in this green peak different than the amount of DNA um, in the green peak for condition B? So that's differential binding. Okay. Um, I sort of went through this already, so we, we fragment the chromatin, um, you know, we, we get the DNA, um, and, and step five there I didn't really um, say previously, but that's, again, that really important step of obtaining the peaks of interest. For those of you who are familiar with RNA-seq, um, you might think of that as like your genes. So with, with RNA-seq, you're really looking at genes that are pre-specified. Um, pre in in ChIP-seq, we do have to identify what the regions are, but that's, um, that's not the task for today. The task for today is to normalize those read counts, again, to get this apples-to-apples -apples comparison, and then perform hypothesis testing for differential binding. Okay, so how much does normalization matter? You know, just to uh, convince you that I'm not the only one that cares, um, woo it all, say normalization for sequencing depth between samples has the greatest potential for influencing differential binding site discovery. All right, so when we're talking about differential binding, normalization is like way up there with one of the most important aspects of what we're doing. And they go on to talk about sort of why and how and what the, what the different pieces are there. Um, all right, so a little vocabulary here. Library size is the total number of maps, um, of mapped reads. All right, so that's going to be an important word for us. Um, and really, it just means if I, if I take my, my little reads that I have down here, these little rectangles, I just count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like all the way across the entire genome. I just count. That's my library size. How many reads did I map onto my genome from my experiment? Um, and, and the number of reads that get mapped change for, for a variety of reasons, right? It, it might have to do with the amount of DNA that was loaded into the sequencer. It might have to do with the antibody quality. Those would be technical reasons. That would be technical variability. That's not really why we're doing the study. The second bullet point says, oh, well, maybe the number of reads is different because of the actual DNA binding. That's the reason that we're doing the experiment, right? We're doing the experiment to uncover the biological variability, but we have to keep in mind that for lots of reasons, there might be technical variability. There's also other factors, peak width, GC content, things like that, that sort of um, affect binding and sequencing and stuff like that. Okay, so, um, you know, I said this previous slide, I said library size, and I said for a given set of regions. So let's talk for a minute what I mean by a region or a unit of measurement. So um, now I have a, a different type of image, but I want you to think that it's exactly the same as the other one. So now I've just got these smooth kind of density peaks, but it's just because it was getting tedious to make all the rectangles. So the, the image that I have here, where we have these, these peaks that have you know, um, been sequenced and aligned to the genome, those are the exact same as these densities you know, right here. Okay, so just think lots of little rectangles um, up on top of each other and kind of smoothed out. It's just a, a different cartoon, um, same idea. So we have condition A, we have condition B, um, and I have three different colors here. So the blue ones are the ones I've sort of alluded to a couple of times already. Those are the regions, so peak calling or, you know, the akin in uh, RNA-seq would be the, the gene. Um, so, uh, you know, we've done this process and we've figured, okay, these peaks are important to us. We can go through and we can think about how many reads aligned to the peaks. That would be library size if I'm thinking about the peaks as my unit of measurement. But with ChIP-seq data, we actually align all of the reads to the entire genome. And so reads that get aligned to the genome, 
but are not within those peak regions are called background bins. And that's those black peaks that you see there. All right, so those black little background pieces are DNA sequences that align to the genome, but are not considered peak regions. And when we use the background to normalize, which again is where we're going here, when we use the background to normalize, what we do is we just split the, um, we split the sequence, uh, the, the genome, into um, uh, even bins, right? So kind of like mile markers on the freeway, right? Just exactly the same number of um, bases uh, per background bin. Um, and and we'll, we'll see how that plays a role down the road. Another, um, another sort of region that we could use is um, something that's typically used with uh, ChIP-seq, or it's often used with ChIP-seq data, is to put a, um, a, an organism that's not the organism of interest, put a little bit of DNA that's not related to the biological experiment into the sample, sequence that, and align it to its own genome, and think, oh, okay, well, if I had a little bit of DNA from some other organism, I could use that to think about my technical variability because I don't expect any biological variability, right? The experiment of interest is not going to capture is not going to capture anything that's going on with this, you know, other piece of DNA. So that's that yellow bit there that'll help me kind of understand um, the uh, the technical variability. All right. So the the roadmap for today, the the goal of this talk is to connect normalization methods with data structure. And I've sort of partitioned how I think about data structure into two different um, ways. One is kind of balance. These aren't great words, but one is kind of balance, and one is regions. I've just spoken a little bit about the regions, um, and we're going to get into the balance now. And what I mean about balance is where do the reads align? So that'll become more clear in a second. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is something um, that I, I refer to it as total protein DNA binding. All right, so, um, so there's a lot going on in this image, so hopefully I'll be able to walk you through uh, exactly, exactly what's going on. So the first thing I want to draw, to draw your eye to is um, this A plot right here. Um, and what's going on in this A plot is capital T truth. All right, so this is not a plot of the data. This is a plot of what's going on in the cell itself. All right, so this is capital T truth that we're trying to get at. And, and um, I don't know if you can read it. It says DNA binding per cell on the y-axis there. Okay, so that A right there says DNA binding per cell, and then we've got condition A and condition B, and I've just, you know, kind of uh, graphically pulled out three different regions or three different peaks, let's say. And what you see in this image when you are omniscient and you get to see capital T truth is you see that regions one and two are not differentially bound, but that region three is differentially bound. All right? And so while you're kind of thinking about capital T truth, you move on to image B here, where image B talks about the proportional shares of binding. So in condition A, you're going to get about a third, a third, a third, right, for each of those regions. And in condition B, you get a quarter, a quarter, a half. All right, so, so we're seeing that when we, when we um, sequence, you know, if we've got any technical variability and we've got kind of wonky things that we need to normalize, we're going to have different proportional representation um, of the reads in condition A and condition B. So then I, you know, I, I have some reads here in, in um, uh, image, image C here, and it turns out, oh no, in condition A, we had all this different technolo technological stuff, right? Maybe I just happened to put a bunch more DNA in the sequencer than I do in condition B, right? So you can see the technolo uh, technolo Technical, that's the word I'm looking for. You can see the technical difference between condition A and condition B, even though the truth is that in condition A and condition B, the blue and the green are the same. Okay, so if we don't normalize this data, right, if we don't 
ask ourselves, how are we going to compare the number of reads in condition A with the number of reads in condition B, we end up with a uh, we, we end up with an analysis that says, oh, green is way up in A, region one is way up in A, and blue is way up in A, and purple is a little bit up in A, right? We've done this like kind of wonky um, analysis because we didn't account for any of that techni technical variability. So this brings us to um, what we think of as total count or library size, or some of you may be familiar with RPKM, which is reads per kilobase per million bases. And it's, it's they're, they're, they use similar methods to kind of say, okay, well, overall, how many counts were there? And let's just divide by that number. So if we divide by that number, what are we doing? We're looking at the proportional representation. So the total count normalization here is gonna give us that proportional share of binding. You're gonna end up dividing by the total number of reads and you're gonna get a third, a third, a third for a condition A and you're gonna get one half, uh, one half and then one quarter, one quarter. So you're gonna get this as the normalization. And of course we know the correct normalization is, um, is what we know as truth. And then when we go and do our fold changes, we see that with no normalization, you know, we get green way up, blue way up, purple a little bit up. Um, with total count normalization, we've, we've improved things a little bit, but we still see that green and blue have a fold change and that purple is not, um, is not down as much as we expect it to. All right, so this is the idea of, of normalization and doing this, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of factoring to get apples and apples comparisons so that then when we go and do something like um, differential binding, we know that we're comparing the, the right number of reads across the two conditions. And, and kind of thinking to ourselves, oh, lots of experiments might have this problem. Right, we're, we're trying to do experiments that differ across condition A and condition B. That's the point, right, of biology. We're trying to figure out, okay, how do things change? And, and it's not unreasonable to think that there could be more different, more um, uh, DNA binding in one of your experimental conditions. So only if we have the same amount of DNA binding, DNA protein binding, across the two experiments overall, would it make sense to do a library size or a total count or an RPKM uh, normalization. So the technical condition, the thing that we have to kind of keep in mind, is that if we're gonna use one of these normalization techniques, we have to believe that the amount, the total overall amount of DNA binding is the same across the two experimental conditions. All right, so, um, so let's keep going here and think about some of these other um, scenarios that might change our what we want to do with normalization and let's go to these spiking controls all right so here's a here's a situation where um where things get really hard get really difficult so what we have is that in condition b we have global up dna binding so for for basically all of the I mean, I know this isn't completely um, realistic. You wouldn't get every, every single region up. But, but this idea that you have some kind of global change in condition B is going to be a, a really difficult um, scenario because it's, it's, you can't uh, then disaggregate the difference between your technical variability and your biological variability. And, and we see the same kind of images here that I had in the previous slide, um, you know, that we, we would have a difference in... Um, in the amount of reads, um, and what we want is we want to normalize them so that condition A and condition B um, are, are really different, but we end up normalizing them so that they're the same, and, and so we really can't find this, um, this differential binding. So, so what we're going to use here is we're going to use these spiking controls. So that's that yellow peak all the way to the left. So that's going to be the unit of measurement that really helps us to do our normalization in this case. And, and so now it's pink. Lots of colors here for fun. So what we do is we put a little bit of DNA from a, from a different organism, and we sequence that, and we say, okay, um, 
you know, now what we see is that the, um, the control is twice as many reads, has twice as many reads in condition A as it does in condition B. So we use that control to say, okay, that's what's happening with the technical variability. Now we know that, um, now we know that, that condition A um, is, uh, you know, uh, condition A has twice as many, so we can now divide everything in condition A by two, right? That's the normalization factor, is I'm gonna divide, I'm gonna say, okay, I should have had half of those reads, so all of the reads in condition A get divided by two, and then lo and behold, I'm like, all good to go, I, I say now I can compare condition A and condition B. So, so, you know, this is normalizing with spike in controls. Well, what has to happen? What's my technical condition? What am I assuming when I do this type of normalization? I'm assuming that these controls behave like the rest of the, the, um, the regions and the rest of the reads, right? So whatever sort of technical conditions are happening um, has to happen in the, in the exact same way. Um, and we have to, of course, have them to have, have the controls exist. Okay, uh, next, symmetry of binding. All right. Um, so I'm going to show you a series of images here now that, that try to get us thinking about the difference between total amount of DNA binding, DNA protein binding, versus symmetry of DNA uh, protein binding. So in this case, we actually have both. We have symmetric and we have the same amount of DNA protein binding per, se per cell. Um, so uh, symmetry, um, what I mean when I talk about symmetry is I'm talking about the number of peaks that are sort of up versus the number, uh, sorry, up in A versus the number of peaks that are up in B. All right, so in this, in this image here, what we see is that there are three green regions that have more differential binding in condition A, and we see we have three orange regions that have more differential binding in B. All right, so we've got, we've got three that are up in A, and we've got three that are up in B. All right, so those are my orange and my green, and then these, these red regions here are not differentially bound. All right, so we've got nine different identified peak regions. Three are up in A, three are up in B, and three are not differentially bound. We've also got that sort of background signal that I'll come back to in a minute. So um, this is an image now where we have symmetry because we have three up in green and three up in orange, right? So three up in A really is what I should say, and three up in B. So we've got symmetry, we've got the same number of genes that are, genes, regions that are, you know, up in each. Um, but we have a different amount of DNA protein binding. So this uh, image here would lead me to problems with that library count normalization, right? So this one has symmetry, but it doesn't have constant DNA protein binding. Um, now we've got an asymmetric picture because there's one region that's up in A and three regions that are up in B, right? So that's asymmetry. There's a different number of regions that are up in each of your two conditions. But it turns out that we have the same DNA protein binding per cell. So the library size and the total count normalization would actually presumably do an okay job here because we've got that overall, um, overall uh, DNA protein binding, which is uh, constant for the two conditions. And then we've got a, a scenario where you have asymmetry and you have different DNA protein binding per cell. Okay. Um, all right, so this, this leads us to think about another normalization technique, um, thinking about using medians. So um, we've already seen this graphic, and, um, and we know that we want to somehow set the, the uh, blue and the green equal to each other because there's no differential binding across blue and green. Um, so what we could do is we could just divide every single, um, every single read count. So the, the read count is, again, um, you know, so for this, this green one right here, you would just go one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, da, 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 count 
all the reads. That's what I mean when I say read count is count reads. So there's a, a read count for this green. There's a read count for this blue. There's a read count for this purple, right? I could count those reads and I could divide every, um, every read count. So, so a read count is per region. Divide each read count by the median in that experimental condition. And now what have I done? I've set the medians equal to each other across experimental um, condition A and condition B, and I've got this idea that, um, that I'll have this apples to apples comparison. So I've you know, talked for a long time already, and I haven't even told you what the essential normalization idea is, but here it is, it's size factors. So, um, so we're gonna be dividing all of our read counts by a number. That's what we do when we normalize. Um, so each sample is divided by a sample specific size factor such that the values of the non-differentially bound peaks do not vary as a function of library size or as a function of biological condition. So that's the essential idea of normalization, and that's sort of what all of my graphics have, have been alluding to along the way, is that we're just dividing by a single number to get this apples to apples comparison and to get rid of any technical variability that might exist across the samples. And it doesn't have to exist across experimental condition A and B, it could exist uh, within replicates as well. Right? So, so even within experimental condition A, you might have four or five replicates, which might um, vary due to technical reasons. So let's expand a little bit on the median idea. I'm going to talk about a method called RLE, relative log expression. This is a normalization method that's um, native to DEseq. So anyone who's used DEseq, it's, it's pretty similar to TMM, which is trimmed mean of M values. TMM is native to edge R. Again, if, if you're doing RNA-seq, those are, those are two methods that you might be familiar with. OK, so what do I have here? I've got these KIJs, which are the number of reads um, aligned to region I under sample J. Um, and I've divided by the geometric mean. This is not super important, um, but it just kind of scales it to, to keep us from having huge numbers and whatnot. So it, it's really not fundamental to the story I'm telling, but just to kind of have my slides be accurate. So what do I want for this size factor? Similar to what I was just talking about with the median, I'd like my size factor, the number I'm going to divide everything by, I'd like my size factor to be the median of these read counts for the non-differentially bound regions. Right? So, so that's what I want. I want to find, OK, the non-differentially bound regions so I can have that apples to apples comparison. All right, so, so how does this work? A little technical here. Um, it's, it's fine if, if you don't follow the math. It's, it's not particularly um, important for the rest of the talk. But the idea is wh where that image is that the green and the purple are not differentially bound. So if I could identify which regions are not differentially bound, I could just take those regions and I could do this mathematics that, I'm, that I've showed you here on this slide where I have the, the median of the counts which are scaled by their geometric mean and, and I have these size factors. And, and you might be able to tell by just looking at those image, the image that the size factor is that condition A is twice as big as condition B. Because you know that the green and the purple are not differentially bound, and I've tried to make it easy on our eyes here, but the idea here is that the green is twice as big in condition A, and the purple is twice as big in condition A. So the size factor we're going for is two, right? We want, we want somehow to get that, that doubling. Um, and, and indeed, if you, if you take the size factor of A divided by the size factor of B, you can see that A is, is twice as big as, as B, which is what we want. OK, but again, we don't know which regions are differentially bound. So this is a ridiculous thing that I'm showing you on this slide, because how am I going to find the regions that are not differentially bound before I've done any of the work to do the differential binding analysis? Well, it turns out that in many situations, the median of the non-differentially bound regions is the same as the median of all of the regions. Well, why is that symmetry? So many of our experiments have the same or roughly the same number of up regions in A as up regions in B. 
And so then when you're talking about, okay, the median, which is just the middle value there, you're saying, huh, well, I'm going to get close to the right value if I'm talking about the median of all the regions. That's going to get me close to the, the median of the not differentially bound regions. And indeed, this is the RLE size factor. OK, so what am I assuming? What are my technical conditions then? Symmetry. So my, my technical conditions say there's roughly symmetric differential binding across the two experimental conditions. That's going to be the key to making sure that, that these quantile median RLE and, and TMM uh, work. All right, so let's look at some simulations. So I've simulated these four conditions. I've already shown you all of these images. Um, you know, I have the, uh, you know, four different configurations there, symmetric, constant DNA binding, symmetric, not constant DNA binding, not symmetric, constant, not symmetric, not constant. Um, and, and I'm going to have on the x-axis, I'm going to have the proportion of peaks that are differentially bound. And um, of the of the peaks that are differentially bound, we're going to have 50% up in A and 50% up in B. But keep in mind, there's also red peaks. So not all of the peaks are differentially bound. So it's just of the ones that are differentially bound, you know, um, are, they, are they more up in A or more up in B or equivalent? And then the, the correct twofold, um, fourfold um, binding uh, to, to, make, to make the DNA binding um, appropriate. So I've already showed you these pictures, but these are the these are the images that are based on that sim same simulation details here. Okay, so a region is differentially bound. I think I already had this slide across uh, conditions A and B. If there's a difference in the amount of DNA binding per cell, um, and and of course what we want to understand is differential binding in the population and at the at the cell level. But of course what we measure is whatever is happening in a sample in a data set. Fortunately for me, I'm omniscient, so I know what um, I'm going to, this is a simulation, which is why I'm omniscient. Um, so I know what happened in the population. I know what I set out to simulate, and then I can assess um, what's happening from the analysis from the sample. And I'm going to use something called the false discovery rate. So the false discovery rate says um, what proportion of statistically significant regions so that means what proportion of peaks that the data said were differentially bound, right? Statistically significant means that the data um, identify the regions as different across A and B. What proportion of those were actually not differentially bound in the population? I didn't set them to be differentially bound. OK, so in my simulation, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, hey, these are equivalent across A and B. But then when I add a little noise and you know, do the analysis, the data pick up a difference. That's a false discovery. And that's called a false discovery rate when you talk about the proportion. I use diff bind, um, again, with these varied normalizations to do this uh, analysis. OK, I've already shown you this picture. This is symmetric, same DNA protein binding per cell. And, and what do we see? Um, so again, on the x-axis is the proportion of peaks. I think I had 1,000 peaks in my simulation. What proportion of those 1,000 peaks are simulated to be differentially bound? And then um, because this is symmetry of the ones that are um, um, simulated to be differentially bound, 50% of them will be um, up in A and 50% would be up in B because it's, because it's symmetric. Um, you see at the bottom how it gets clo very close to false discovery rates because um, because everything's differentially bound. So, so when you have 100%, you can't have any false positives because they're all differentially bound. So that's why that, that line comes down. And we see RPKM does, does a little bit of wonky stuff, but generally everything is, um, is, is being controlled by, um, uh, by the false discovery rate. And 0.05 is where I've controlled it, and that's that, that black line. Um, so now we've got symmetric and different DNA protein binding. Um, and what we see is that, as expected, 
library size and RPKM aren't able to control false discovery rate um, because there's a different amount of DNA binding per cell in, in those two conditions. And, and RPKM and library peaks are, are, are making the assumption that, um, that there's the same amount of DNA binding. Uh, here we've got um, asymmetric, so a different um, amount of um, up in A versus up in B, but we have the same uh, uh, DNA protein binding per cell. Um, and, uh, and RPKM is, is, again, doing kind of a little bit of wonky things, but really what we see is that both RLE and TMM um, start to uh, really kind of violate that um, that false discovery rate when we have a large number of gene, a large number of regions that are differentially bound, um, and we have asymmetry, right? So now my median gene, my median region that I'm trying to use as as my baseline um, now is going to be a, a differentially bound peak instead of of that class of, of non differentially bound peaks. And this is asymmetric and different DNA protein binding per cell. And you see that, you know, um, they all kind of go a little bit haywire. I didn't mention this. You can see it better in this one. Um, the oracle is, is, you know, again, I'm omniscient. So I knew what the size factor was for each sample. So I could just use the oracle, the size factor, as, um, as the normalization. And, and it, it, you know, kind of is, is what we should be comparing to. All right, one more little bit of normalization here, background bins. So I've, um, I've, I've referred to this a couple of times that we could have, you know, we could, we have all this information about the entire genome, so we could use that as the, um, uh, as, the, as the way to normalize. We could say, okay, across these two experimental conditions, what if we just use the amount of DNA that was, um, that was mapped to the entire, entire genome? Um, and, and now I'm showing you four images, or four pairs of images, I guess, and they, they look very familiar to you, I assume, because I've shown them to you now a couple of times, but they have one difference, which is that in condition B, for all of the pairs, there's more black. So I've simulated them such that condition B just happens to get a little more, um, a little more background noise. So those rogue uh, DNA um, pieces that shouldn't have been there because they weren't attached to the antibody, you know, the protein and then the antibody that came along in the ChIP-seq experiment, um, you know, uh, and, and, and so my question is how is that going to impact what, what we're seeing? Um, and, and so, you know, first before I show you the results, um, what is that underlying technical condition? Well, it's that the number of rogue DNA reads should be the same across the two experimental conditions. And, and they're not in my simulations, right? In my simulations, I made them to be more heavily um, distributed according to uh, in experimental B, in experiment B. And, and this is that picture kind of zoomed in a little bit. We've got the symmetry. We've got the same DNA protein binding per cell. That's within the peaks. So the same DNA protein binding per cell within the peaks, but then we have non-constant background. And um, now when we use library size across all the bins instead of peaks, um, and, and we use RLE, and we use TMM, and we use RPKM, the false discovery rate is not controlled at all. Right, so kind of putting that little bit of background noise into, uh, into the simulation really um, makes the, these overall library size um, uh, <laughs> methods problematic. Symmetry, different DNA binding in the peaks, and non-constant background. Again, we see the same problem um, with, the, um, with the bin methods. So the bin methods are just being overwhelmed by, the, um, by those background bins in, in condition B. And we also see that library is, is, causing, is having problems, as we saw before, because we have a different amount of DNA binding. Oh, sorry. Um, asymmet asymmetry, but same DNA binding in the peaks, but again, non-constant background. Um, 
the bins overwhelm this, but we do see down here that the RLE methods, um, again, you know, that's that's the same uh, trend we saw that RLE and TMM, um, you know, kind of came up and, and started to lose that false discovery rate control um, when we had asymmetry, right? So the bins are overwhelming it, but we see that problem with asymmetry um, with the RLE and uh, TMM. Um, asymmetric, different DNA binding per cell. Um, and again, you know, you kind of see everything, uh, the, the bins overwhelming, overwhelming the normalization. So we're not controlling our false discovery rate at all. Um, all right, so really quickly here, just um, this is, you know, it was sort of motivated through work um, with, with a colleague, um, and, and I just want to show you a tiny little bit of her data. So um, she works on a parasite called T. brucei, um, and um, this, this particular parasite uh, changes in morphology and metabolism um, over, over time. Um, it's sort of irrelevant, but the, the samples were taken at one hour, three hours, 24, and 76. We have three samples at each of those time points. And so all I've done is just normalize. I didn't do any differential binding because I can't really do false discovery rate anyway because um, I don't know truth. I'm not omniscient in this situation. But what I can do is I can look at principal component um, plots. And apologies for those of you who, who haven't seen principal components before, but I'm, I'm just taking a, a large, um, a high dimensional data set and I'm, I'm sort of breaking it down into, into two dimensions. And the colors um, represent the, um, the time points. So we have three samples at each of these time points, one hour, three hours, 24, um, 76. And, and you can kind of see some, some trends to where each of the, the time points are, we've got library background, library peaks, RPKM, you know, and then I've got done RLE and TMM with peaks and with background. Um, but, but really the best normalization is with the, is with the spike in. So again, T. brucei, it's a parasite. We put a little bit of yeast um, DNA into each of our experiments, and we were able to sequence that and align it to the yeast genome, and we were able to use those reads to kind of identify any technical variability. And, and what we see, you know, is that um, maybe this TMM spike in here where we've got these, um, you know, the three one hours and the three um, 76 hours or the orange ones and the three three hours over here. And then my colleague tells me that at 24 hours, everything goes crazy that that's like when this parasite is, is doing its most wonkiness. So, so she says, oh, well, I'd expect the samples for the 24 hours to not be, you know, super closely aligned. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm just, this is just a summary of all the plots together. So I've already shown you all this and then a, a little bit of power, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, just summarize here. So if you have spikens and if you can trust them, they're important to use in the normalization because um, th there may be some kind of shifts and some kind of technical variability that can cannot be detected without controls. Um, and, and fortunately, ChIP-seq data often comes with controls, so that's a really lovely thing to be to be using in those experiments. Um, and the correct normalization method really depends on your, your biological experiment. Are you seeing global shifts in differential binding? Do you expect symmetry? Like what is going on with your particular experiment? Um, and, and if you are not normalizing correctly, what you're gonna see is downstream problems, whether you're doing hypothesis testing and you're gonna get false discovery rates incorrect, or you're doing clustering and you're gonna get some kind of, of, of weird patterns, um, that normalization can be pretty important. Um, and, and there's no single normalization technique which is the perfect um, one to use. Um, but understanding the methods and understanding how they relate to the biological sort of scenarios that, that I've described here can really help you decide, you know, what, what you might want to use. And thank you very much. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. I know I'm like right on time, so I don't know if I have time to take questions or not. Thank you.